Oh, went on live quickly. Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. May the force be with you. I say that because today I saw um, Rogue One and I enjoyed it. I'm not going to put any spoilers out there, but I really enjoyed oh. it. It was great. And uh, I think, uh, didn't Emma Grundy do well? Very few people will understand that reference. Very uh, None of you American, North American types will understand that reference. Um, we're joined this evening, or good afternoon even, by um, John uh, from Parrot, Patrick, and then um, Rob Lefebvre, um, helicopter maker, uh, all the way up there in Canada. So let's start with Rob. Rob, you've launched your 800E. Procyon. Actually, tell me, what's it called and what does it mean? What does that name mean? Uh, Procyon, and it is the name of a star. I, you know, it, just about everything's named after a star. I tried to find one that hadn't been used much, and that's what it was. <laughs> Simple okay. as that. And 800E, what does the 800E part of that mean? Uh, the 800 is the blade size, so 800 millimeters, uh, and E for electric. But aren't helicopters old hat? I mean, aren't we all doing multi-rotors now? Surely nobody wants to do it the old way. <laughs> uh, well, it's kind of the, uh, the re well, the return of the Jedi, I guess you could say, uh, <laughs> to continue with the Star Wars reference. <laughs> You know, helicopters. Uh, helicopters were around for a lot longer than multi rotors, um, but uh, you know, the multi rotors are sort of the new, uh, you know, a little bit bandwagonish. Uh, they have a lot of a lot of really good um, points, uh, reasons to use them. Um, but helicopters still have a lot of um, uh, have a lot of advantages of their own, and um, uh, so I hope that they're coming back. One of the, one of the big things that has you know, held it back historically is that because they existed before multi rotors and flight controllers were around, they were manual manually flown, and so people uh, people have come to understand that they are uh, or come to think of them as hard to fly because you had to have a real pilot flying it manually. Um, versus multi rotors sort of in, were invented at the same time as flight controllers were invented, and so everybody's perception grew up that. You know, multi rotors are easy to fly, but uh, you know what? Um, once you add that same flight controller to a helicopter, it's just as easy to fly. So, so then, what's the advantage? So I've added the flight controller to it. I've still got '70s technology spinning around, haven't I? What's the advantage? Oh, it's not '70s technology. I mean, we've got all the same technology that uh, that the multi rotors have. I'm using the same brushless motor technology. Uh, <laughs> I've got brushless motors in my servos. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's, it's, it's all new technology as well. The advantages are that they serve a really good, useful purpose for, uh, filling this sort of middle range, um, uh, flight profile where, uh, you know, if, if you're really just doing hovering or flying around slowly shooting video, multi rotors are great because they're nice and simple. Um, but, uh, if your mission doesn't really require a fixed wing, if you don't need multiple hour, um, flight times, and uh, also if your requirement, uh, if your flight requires vertical takeoff and landing, which which a lot of them do, uh, helicopter fits that role really well for a medium range uh, system. Where so you've got the the vertical takeoff and landing, but we can fly up to an hour at at high flight speeds compared to multi rotors. Um, and so if, if I was uh Sorry, if I was on a mapping mission then and I had a, a camera, a, st a stabilized cam camera platform underneath uh, your helicopter, I could then get a lot more done in an hour's flight time because I'd be going that much faster. Yeah, exactly. That much faster. And, and as well, it, even if you're trying to fly slow, it allows you to do a mission on windier days because you can fly upwind and maintain your ground speed. Um, so, you know, most countries have regulations which require visual line of sight of the aircraft and that restricts the range that an operator can fly to about 500 meters uh, from the operator, um, which really limits the amount of ground that you can cover before you have to land the thing, move, and then and then start a new a new mapping run. And um, you know, a lot of airplanes uh, are capable of covering much more ground than that. Um, so you're not able to take advantage of the uh, of the long range that they have, uh, and then you have to bring it in and land it. And the landing and takeoff procedures are always you know can be troublesome with with airplanes. 
Um, so helicopters, it kind of fits that perfect. You can fly for up to an hour, which just about perfectly fit, you know, with the flight speeds we can achieve, that allows you to map about a square kilometer. Uh, with the operator standing in the middle and then come in for a nice easy vertical landing um, it's uh, you know really good like that so and um, cost of operation uh, compared to a multi-rotor a uh, multi-rotor is just several tiny little propellers and that's some big blades that probably need uh, track and balance and things like that how operationally how how do they work um it's uh, I'm selling them ready to fly, of course, so that you don't need to to do those things. Um, high quality blades, high quality mechanics, really um, eliminate the need for uh, for track and balance. I mean, good quality blades these days are, are dynamically balanced by the manufacturer, um, and uh, all the linkages I set them up with digital calipers, and it's usually perfect right out of the box. I don't need to touch the uh, the track and balance. So, um, you know. That's uh, fr fairly straightforward there. And cost, actually, the costs on um, some of the helicopter stuff is actually uh, surprisingly affordable. So, for example, uh, uh, these big 800 blades, um, you know, they're about $150 a set. What is a, what is a single 30-inch uh, T-motor propeller is, uh, you know, I think they're about $200 each, and you need eight of them. So, hmm. Mm. So, what the 800E behind you there? What just just um, fill us in? What can it lift in for? How long? You said an hour, I think. What sort of weight are we talking about there? Yeah, like the hour would be perfect conditions. Um, you know, with a light or no payload. Uh, you know, it's sort of everybody's playing that game. So that's that's uh, uh, that's the the number that uh, that it can do with with those sort of conditions. And that's also that's moving. Uh, one of the interesting things about the helicopter is it actually uses less power to move at a cruise speed than it does at uh, in a hover um, versus uh, you know multi rotors their lowest power is is in a hover and as soon as you start moving through the wind they take more and more and more power so um, the payload of this it's designed it's optimized for about one to two kilograms um, uh, payload on the front there's a, a built-in vibration damped uh, camera mount uh, or well, really any sensor can be mounted to it. It's fairly flexible that way. Um, but then it can also be configured to lift up to four kilograms underneath the center of gravity, which uh, uh, I'm using for some applications where a sensor has to be hung from the aircraft. So, I was going to talk about that. That's underslung loads, isn't it? Now, what what are they yeah. doing with those underslung loads? Stay up, you can. What are they doing with those underslung loads? Uh, that application is for a magnetometer, um, which is used for mining exploration, and the magnetometer is extremely sensitive, so it needs to be quite a long way away from the vehicle itself to avoid interference from the uh, from the vehicle itself. And this this is the first helicopter that you've 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 bought to market. Have you got a range in mind? Have you got several others being planned, larger, smaller? Um. Well, I'm definitely planning on doing a smaller one. I want to do something that sort of competes with uh, your typical quadcopter with 15-inch propellers. Um, and uh, so I, I've got something in mind, and it'll be, um, you know, one of the design goals with this was extreme simplicity. Uh, and so, you know, I've done that as much as I can. It still features a single belt drive because nobody makes a motor big enough and slow enough to, to turn that rotor direct drive. But on a smaller version, um, uh, it gets into the range where I can uh, use a really large multi-rotor motor, direct drive to the main, and then uh, fixed pitch tail uh, drive. So it'll be a very simple machine. Um, and that'll be, so that'll be a smaller one, probably about 500 size. And then I'm also going to be announcing soon um, this thing, which uh, is just a... Uh, a Blade CF, uh, 250 CFX helicopter just from the hobby store comes ready to fly and it had some other piece of junk autopilot that's in a pile over there. I take that off and I uh, put a Pix Racer on it. And um, so uh, I'm not, I, I'll probably be selling these to Pro Scion customers, but it's not really uh, something I'm intending to sell, you know, in any kind of volume. Uh, but what I will be doing actually is uh, doing a whole open source. Uh, I'm going to open source the the 3D printing files I did for the mounts for the the Pix Racer and the GPS, and uh, the parts list and uh, my parameters and and all that stuff, so that anybody that wants to have a play with 
uh, UAV helicopters can um, just go to my page and they'll get the info and then they can set one of these up for themselves. It's really simple because it, it comes ready to fly, uh, but you just have to remove the uh, the existing electronics and put this on. But there's uh, you know there's no wire cutting or anything involved, no soldering, so um, it's uh, super straightforward. So anybody who wants to have a play with a you know a nice small harmless helicopter. Um, that, that'll be an option. So I see that I see the GPS on the boom there. So that would become fully autonomous with that PIX racer, would it? So this will be. Um, it's about what was it? 380 grams without the battery, and then I'm adding the battery is about 180 grams, and so it'll be fully autonomous. Um, flight time 12 to 15 minutes. So now tell me. Why did why why have you put the pick race? Why why the electronics position where they are in a helicopter like that behind the blades, sort of uh, uh, slightly off the center of gravity, really? Because that's where it fits. Um, okay, yeah, <laughs> good answer. No, there's a gear here, uh, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, typically it's not on the center of gravity with a helicopter, and the fact is, it's a common misconception that a lot of people have that the IMU has to be dead on the center of gravity of the vehicle. Um, I can't speak for all flight programs, but for RG Pilot, it doesn't matter that much, really, at all. I have uh, I have a large gas-powered helicopter in the other room. The uh, the IMU, the, the entire Pixhawk, is about, well, a foot in front of the center of gravity anyway. It's about uh, two, 200 centimeters now um, you, in front you, of the center you, of gravity. You've just led very nicely into the fact that you you basically the helicopter lead for uh, RG Pilot, aren't you? Uh, yes, yes. I, uh, I've been doing that for a couple of years. I, um, last, uh, last spring, I actually, uh, or, well, March, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, I, uh, officially resigned those duties because I was concentrating on engineering this machine. Um, so I was not involved with the launch of, uh, of, uh, Argicopter 3.4. Um, but I'm starting to review that code now because I'll be using it with this system. So, um, but yeah, up until that point, I was the, the helicopter lead. Um, so, and have you got a um, Pixel 2.1 in the new machine or, or are you using another flight controller? Uh, not yet. I, I do have one. I'm going to be uh, using it uh, on, a, on a quadcopter first. Um, but uh, I, I do plan to change to them. It's just. Uh, requires a little bit of um, you know some engineering uh, work to go into it to prove it out to make sure it's uh, uh, suitable for the application. I think on the larger machine it might not be suitable um, because of the lower rotor speed. The uh, I, I have some data from a from a very large multi rotor where the uh, the damping is. Um, the built-in damping in the in the uh, 2.1 is not effective with the, you know this is a lo very large 28 inch propeller uh, multi rotor so um, uh, you know Philip Rouse uh, um, we can work with him to try to uh, to fix that uh, so that uh, it's it's better tuned for these different systems but um, anyway so some work to be done there I will be trying to use it first on the on that mid size machine I was uh, talking about because um, I think it, it should have a higher rotor speed and um, uh, so the vibration frequency should uh, be more favorable. And auto rotation. What about auto rotations? Uh, auto rotation is not built into RG Pilot yet. It, there's no automatic auto rotation feature. I do want to add that. Somebody actually added it about three years ago, uh, as part of a post or post grad thesis at a, a university in the uh, United States. But uh, he didn't share his code back with the project, unfortunately. But I do have his white paper, and I hope to implement it at some point. Um, one of the reasons that sorry, 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 but yeah. surely then that then. That brings the advantage of that the helicopter, you know, s squarely to the fore. Then, if you can auto rotate, then as long as the ground you're landing into is okay, then job yeah. good. Yeah, and that's the thing is, I, I mean, I, I, um, I don't like to talk that up too much because there's a couple of reasons, and so one of them is, I mean, aircraft should be designed to not have power failures. Um, so it, it really should. Um, uh, it shouldn't be a huge consideration, um, and because you know, even if you have a power failure and you can auto rotate down, um, depending on what's under you, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, it's if you're directly over your your landing pad or a smooth surface, that's great. Um, but oftentimes with UAVs, we're not, um, and so you know, first and foremost, they should be designed to not lose power. 
Um, so just to put that out there, but uh, but for sure, um, it, it it will be added uh, at the very least uh, a controlled descent to limit limit damage to the the aircraft and the payload um, versus uh, you know multi rotor. It's always it's terminal. Um, but uh, a helicopter has the ability to uh, you know descend at several meters per second, you know in a, in a controlled state, um, which certainly would um, uh, would help things out quite a bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll be adding that to the code at some future point. The, the other reason why it never happened before is also because it could become very expensive in, in airframes trying to uh, trying to write that code. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but we now have a uh, actually a, a new simulation environment um, that uh, is actually uh, pretty good and we'll be able to do a lot of it in the simulator. So. Yeah, no, it's, it's exciting stuff. And then I can see, you know, um, taking off in a more correct uh, uh, helicopter manual uh, manner uh, backing away from your uh, takeoff uh, area ready to land forward should anything go wrong just like you would in the real one um, mm -hmm. towering takeoffs and things like that all, all that sort of thing would be very very handy when you're trying to save at the end of the day an expensive sensor because that's mm -hmm. what the game would be about is saving the sensor yeah doesn't matter yeah. about the helicopter that can go yeah. to bits <laughs> so yeah I, i've sensor. been <laughs> I, i've been working on uh, i've been working on this slowly so we've got um the main rotor speed feedback into the pixhawk already um so uh, you know this machine here has it has it already it's got speed feedback so the the operator can see that but uh, the the auto auto rotation code isn't done yet it probably won't take long to do um you know, basically just a controlled descent uh, to limit damage should be fairly straightforward. But uh, all of the logic to do a perfect, you know, flared landing with a, you know, a nice touchdown, uh, that's going to be quite a bit more complicated. Uh, and it would definitely require a laser altimeter um, on the okay. uh, on the vehicle because, you know, if you don't know where the ground really, really is, then there's just no way. Um, so. Hmm. Mm. Well, otherwise you'd just be doing a constant rate approach to place X, you know, slowing down that rate of descent. Um, yeah, well, you'd it just you wouldn't work because you'd you know you'd yeah. flare either too you'd late for the flare, or yeah, nothing for you'd the flare, flare yeah. too early, and then uh, and then you'd lose all your rotor speed and, and free fall anyway. So you really yeah. have to know exactly where the ground is to have a, a chance of doing that. So <laughs> well, it's fantastic. We wish you the. The very best of luck with it, and look forward to seeing a lot more. And I, I'm really looking forward to seeing that underslung load in action, mm. and uh, yeah. see what happens with that. That sounds very cool. And uh, yeah, sure it's, it, it, I hope to get some video of that soon. The uh, the, the sensor in the in the video uh, that you may have seen is just a dummy load. Uh, the actual sensor is larger than the helicopter, uh, so it's it's pretty interesting to see them flying around. That just made me think when I talk, you're talking about uh, we're saying underslung loads. Did did everybody see the underslung load video today of Mr. Neistat being the underslung <laughs> load? Did anyone see that? Yeah, no, crazy. Loretta. I did. Yeah. yeah, I get to see it. You didn't see it yet, Loretta. Oh, okay. No, no. It's yeah. Well, all right. Has anyone got any thoughts on that? Well, while I've opened that one up. It, yeah, it's it, it is. nuts. It is simultaneously the most awesome and the dumbest thing I've seen in a long time. Yes, it's about right, I think. It's a huge, um, I think it's an Octo, isn't it? Um, do, we, do we know it's, who built it for him? Yeah, it's some custom job, and it's actually, a, it's a, I think you'd call it a, a, a Deca hexacopter. It's 16 rotors. Um, Was it? Okay. Yeah. And uh, I actually, somebody somewhere on the internet called fake, but I actually, so I actually looked into it. Uh, there's one video where I can see the make of the motors. They're, they're KDE uh, 8216s, which are rated at uh, 30 pounds thrust each, and there's 16 of them. So that's, and, and that's only at 75% throttle. So leaving you your, you know, your, your margin for control, um, you know, to generate 480 pounds of, of thrust. So it's certainly plausible that, you know. What it, could, it could go wrong? Stuff. Yeah. That. <laughs> now somebody was saying you had a body harness on and and no no cutaway, no visible means of cutting away should a flyaway occur. Yeah, there's a 15 minute uh, making of video and they showed him putting the body harness on. I didn't see a release mechanism, so <laughs> it's like that uh, poster from like the 80s, you know. Hang in there, baby. 
<laughs> well, I, I, I was just disappointed it wasn't um, Santa's sleigh. That would have been much cooler, you know, <laughs> if you were sat in the sleigh with the suit on. That would have been very cool, just hanging. You know, if you're going to hang from a line, you might as well do the umbrella bit and be Mary Poppins or something like that. That would be cool. That would be very cool. Well, there you cool. go. You could, you could email them and uh, put in some suggestions. Well, you, you do a, could, could you do a, a sleigh being pulled by eight tiny solos? <laughs> How many well, get the, the air? <laughs> that that cost 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 a lot less than it would have done um, six months ago if you wanted to try and do that. Um, yeah. And you could film it because they'd have the um, this, yes, there are two ninety nine. I think is it two ninety nine or three ninety nine at Best Best Buy at the moment, folks. If you wish to two ninety nine in the US yeah. right now. Yeah, I think it's the last container, isn't it? From what I've heard. But anyway, let's move on oh, really? swiftly from that. Yes, yeah, that's what I've heard. Anyway, anyway, moving on very swiftly, um, John. John, tell us about Slam Dunk. Tell us, firstly, why Parrot um, is enjoying having such fantastic naming conventions. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a popular topic. Uh, it's, uh, they're all, uh, most of them have been dances, right? So bebop and, and disco and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, this one they took after their uh, ongoing creative naming uh, style and uh, went with Slam Dunk. So uh, basically what it is is a stereoscopic uh, camera setup with rangefinders uh, and an NVIDIA K1 um, processor inside. And so what it's designed to do uh, is create real-time point clouds. Um, and so it runs Ubuntu 14.04 uh, uh, and ROS uh, Indigo. And uh, we have a, basically a built-in um, example that runs in RViz that just allows you to, uh, you know, kind of point it around the room and you can either build a, uh, a real-time point cloud, uh, a concatenated point cloud, um, depth map, op occupancy grid, uh, things like that. Uh, and so we have those basic kind of examples built into the uh, into the operating system, um, and you know really it's a standalone device. So you uh, plug in a micro uh, micro HDMI connector to an HDMI TV or whatever. Uh, you do a Bluetooth uh, USB connector to a, a Bluetooth keyboard and a mouse, and you give it 12 volts of power, and uh, and that's it. So it's uh, really a standalone computer, a standalone development environment. Um, Why? <laughs> autonomy, right? So, you know, I think there's a big debate over what's uh, automated versus autonomous versus, you know, autonomous. Programmed. Right? What is, yeah, exactly. What is, what are the definitions of all of that? Um, you know, what, why we designed this was to help foster um, innovation in the robotics space. So, you know, a lot of people had been developing their own SLAM devices and taking Raspberry Pis or Odroids or whatever, connecting cameras to them and writing a SLAM algorithm and, and building a SLAM device. They were doing that as their PhD project. Um, and so what we said was, why don't we help, uh, you know, kickstart that SLAM part of this so that people can not worry about making this, but rather make the algorithms and the behaviors um, that this enables uh, available on their robots. So basically, it fits on any robot that speaks Ross um, in the air or on the ground or in the ocean or wherever. Um, so, so that might the, help. That might help us to uh, in in our world to land a little bit more accurately to miss things. Uh, yeah. and have a general awareness of where the self-awareness for the vehicle of where it is in its world. Yeah. So uh, one of the most interesting uh, examples that I've seen so far um, is TU Delft uh, in the Medical Express Challenge about a month or so ago. First of all, they had an amazing aircraft uh, with a variable, uh, variable pitch uh, transitioning bi-wing, I guess you'd call it. Um, so super awesome aircraft uh, in terms of pushing that kind of innovation. But what they did is they mounted this on it so that when it transitioned back to a vertical state, 
Uh, it got there. Um, they, they actually had their own uh, depth algorithms running on board and were able to identify a safe landing zone in an automated fashion. So they could say, okay, I'm over a tree, I'm over some bushes. Okay, this is grass here. My depth profile is much lower, uh, and this is a safe place to land. So uh, that's what those guys use this for. But they use their own algorithms on them. And will they be feeding that back into the system? Is that all open source? I guess it is, if it's to you, Delft. Yeah, so it really is a standard uh, Linux environment. I'm sure you know people who understand it better than I do uh, will find where the little SDK slash black box limit is. Um, but from my understanding, um, you are completely uh, able to replace the SLAM algorithms on here with your own algorithms. So you don't have to run our SLAM code. We just put our SLAM code on there as an example. Um, so you know, I think you've noticed in the past that, SLAM, uh, that Parrot in general is very open to collaboration um, and working with people at the SDK level and working with people even uh, at the code level. Um, and so uh, I think we've enabled just enough accessibility to this to really make it usable in that kind of research robotics environment. Um, and uh, I'm all ears if we, we hit, a, uh, hit a gate somewhere that, uh, that we need to talk through. But uh, it should be pretty open for everybody. That's amazing stuff. And what sort of money do they go for? You know, they're selling for $9.50. So that's for the complete uh, standalone device. So are you providing much of the software, or is it basically just the hardware with just, I guess, the skeleton of the operating system? Yeah, it's, it's pretty much just a skeleton kind of framework. So it boots up into uh, Windows Manager. I can't remember which one. It's like X Lite or something like that. And then so you basically it boots up into a graphical interface, and you have an RViz uh, script file that you can double click on the RViz script file and it opens right up into an RViz visualization that shows you, you know, the concatenated point cloud or the real-time point cloud or the occupancy grid or the depth map. But what needs to happen, where, where, um, uh, where adopters of the technology come in is writing the, beha the ROS behaviors based upon the real-time information that this is providing, right? So it's just another sensor in the array of sensors that you're using on your robot. Um, and you subscribe to the ROS topics that this thing is providing and say, hey, I want just a left RGB image and I want your depth map. And now I'm sending that depth map, pre-calculated depth map and, and single RGB lines to another ROS node to do additional machine learning or artificial intelligence on or whatever. But that's basically the idea. Get um, completed um, environmental data um, through ROS, other nodes to help make decisions. Well, geez, John, for nine ninety nine, I would think it would be self-aware, self-learning, and, and self-induced. Fully you autonomous. Know. <laughs> I want it to read my mind, like come up and mind meld me. Just, yeah. uh, just get it done and get back to me. I, I think the things that mind meld you will probably look something like this with the, uh, with the you know, eyeballs. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> How how close would it have to be to mind Melmu? But how, what's its range? What, what's what, what, what's its range? Um, so we're gonna get out to uh, we're gonna get out to about uh, forty meters. Uh, forty to sixty meters is gonna be kind of where it's gonna run out. The the ultrasonic range finders on the front um, get out to about fifteen meters, um, and uh, but it can calculate it can calculate depth you know, out at forty. Meters. Okay, so you know, top end of a, a landing approach, or you know, a fair, fair old way out to, for a landing yeah. approach. G GPS will get you a good, good amount of the way, and then from 40 meters, that, that would be pr pretty good you know, from a fixed wing sort of a uh, point of view. If it could take yeah. over from there, yeah, It'd your precision cool. increases. You know, the closer you get to things, so you know, my precision rate is going to be about uh, one centimeter at about 1.5 meters, and about um, half a meter at 10 meters. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of depends a little bit as you're, uh, as you're coming down in, in terms of the resolution that you'll get out of it or the accuracy you'll get out of it, but um, that's about how far it 
have you got any what have you got any really cool projects that currently using it that you could um share with us yeah i mean you know we're definitely going to have it running on a bebop and have bebop 2 do fully you know um i guess autonomous exploration right and so how do i just take off turn around in a 360 understand my environment understand my depth map and say okay let's go over here and i'm going to start building my map until i can't build it anymore and I'm going to turn back around and find some other areas that I haven't been to already to continue exploring and continue to build my map. And I think that's kind of the first use case is proving that we can, um, other than, I think the first use case that people really implement are going to be ground-based robotics, um, just because it's they're a little bit more well-developed. And this is, again, just another sensor that's just speaking into a ROS, existing ROS system. I think putting these on drones, um, is something that, uh, you know, is still the early days. But I think the first useful implementation would be, hey, you know, go fly around in an indoors environment, build me a map to, you know, X resolution, and uh, export to a point cloud for me. And so if I can get a point cloud exported, um, there's some value there. Hmm. Hmm. It's, it's something that a swarm could uh, do a great job with as well. You know, you can instantly see a swarm of multi-rotors, uh, mapping their environment and speaking of swarms here comes Bruce all the way. Good day, Bruce. How are you going? Oh, I'm good. Thanks. Good man. Good. We're just hearing um, great things um, about slam dunk um, So Well, we look forward to seeing it roll out. I suppose <laughs> But what 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 can definitely be said John is you you have definitely won the background for today you are <laughs> the king of views and you have one you have one and that's that um cool. yeah, yeah. A nice day today. yeah no it looks a lovely day in san francisco and uh, good evening also to gene i didn't actually say good evening or good afternoon to loretta you know as well um we were talking earlier actually before we came on air it's been hot here it's been really really hot uh, it was 48 yesterday which is uh, 118.4 in those ridiculous american units of measurement that nobody else understands but because the number's bigger it must mean you've won anyway um it was it's, so it's 48 and i saw bruce you have got yourself uh, from banggood a collection of parts that only just arrived with you, but I notice it's black EPP, and it, it bewilders me that anybody has black aircraft where there's any sun. Um, have you managed to put that thing together yet, Bruce? No, not yet. That's what I'm going to do this morning, but you're right about the black. It goes horrible in the sun, but maybe it's because it, now it's stealthy. You know, it's a big thing. <laughs> well, well, I just... I noticed when I was doing a price check on the uh, solo that there's actually looks like there's a black Phantom Four. Yes, I've seen that at uh, Best Buy. It was a special edition. Oh, no, he's giving away the ago. free stuff. That's that that's that blue box store. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. Oh. Yeah, now black, all in black now. Well, <laughs> it's the new one. It's a new orange, yes. Good it luck is. if it's a hot day somewhere like this and you're trying to fly it because the internal temperatures of the aircraft would go through the, through the roof. So there's no wonder electronics and stuff suffer. Um, uh, the Pixel, I've mentioned it for the second time, but the 2.1 is, is heated uh, to 60 degrees C inside and a lot of people are, you know, a lot of people are wondering why it's a good idea to keep things temperature st uh, stable, but but it is anyway uh what else was i going to talk about um we were going to oh casey we've spoken about casey let's ask you about the the thing aquila aquila what really happened what really happened patrick come on tell us patrick what really happened i just uh you know the perpetual motion machine didn't work out you know I think they got to go back to the drawing board. Uh, it, it's a very difficult uh, problem that they're trying to solve. You know, an idea that a, a uh, aircraft can stay on station almost indefinitely. Um, I don't know. I I, I I don't know what to say without being critical. <laughs> so, uh, I'll pass that on. It all went very well until it got close to the ground, didn't it? Um, and it's interesting that the NTSB reports only just come out. Um, 
uh, that seemed to take quite well, a long while. And I and will then, let me let me just say one thing with that. I mean, they were flying out at YPG, is where I, you know I was working. I worked out there, and you were talking about hot temperatures. It's always hot out there. Mm. Um, but you know they they were doing it at a, it's a secret military base. You have to have a, a secret security clearance or be escorted to be on that facility. That's a lot where uh, we worked. Um, when I worked down there, and I think it's kind of interesting that you know this private company went to a military base like that. One of uh, the reasons that was inferred was for privacy, and uh, that was one of the reasons that we at SUS News got tipped off about the investigation, is that uh, that Facebook was one of their privacy. The other thing I thought was pretty interesting is even in the Silicon Valley, I'd mentioned it. I was at a um, a VC thing for Orange and Pillsbury, the law firm, and I said, "Hey, well, you know that thing, uh, the Aquila crashed," and everybody was like, "No, it, no, it didn't. It, it was, it was fine. It was perfect. It, it was a total success." And I'm like, "Yeah, okay, whatever." And now that it's come out, I haven't heard from those people who told me I was crazy. I hear that a lot. It's a reoccurring theme. Yeah, did, that's that's on many levels. Did you just say that Facebook was concerned about their privacy? <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, that was why we got the tip off. I can't, I can't, you know, I can't even really paraphrase the email with the tip off. Uh, but let's say, you know, there was a reference to uh, them wanting their privacy and being, well, I can't even say it anyway. Yes. <laughs> but they had to make a, I, I guess they had to, you know, to get the insurance check, you have to, you know, have a report that the insurance company wasn't going to pay out just on. Zuckerberg's word, I guess. Maybe. Loretta, is there anything that's caught your eye this week now you're back from China and have had a chance to reflect over the homeland and goings on? <laughs> homeland. <laughs> well, it's kind of a, a depressing homeland from some people's perspective, but. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I did understand I got some. Uh, intelligence that the transition team was meeting with FAA executives on yesterday. So, today. so whatever yeah. Oh, so that that's well, as we used to say back on the job, that's hot poop. Um, so <laughs> the new the new uh, the new teams meeting with the uh, with the FAA. So what but what could they do? They couldn't change or do anything now, could they? Well, I just thought it was interesting, one, that they had a UAS transition group specifically and that they were meeting today. So that was the that extent. Is. I did not get any information on who was on it, uh, but I did understand. Now they As an outsider, it seems that the the transition teams are uh, uh, interesting, shall we say, on uh, uh, some of the people that they've chosen, and 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 not a lot of them have been thought about. So for them to have to actually have put you know put put their minds to UAS must must be interesting. I thought it was, and you're the first I've told. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much. So, Americans, what do you think? Canadian and Kiwi and South African, we, we need not speak now. Well, I you know, I, uh, it'd be interesting to see where we go from here. Um, I don't know. Some of the stuff that's coming out of, uh, well, I've seen uh, like at Airworks and whatever else, there's, there's talk about uh, aircraft certification and things like that. I still think we're probably realistically a ways away from the beyond visual line of sight, um, I don't. I don't know that I see any big revelations for 2017. Anyone else want to make some predictions, or anything big coming out of the FAA? I think. I think you might see more uh, beyond line of sight waivers. Let. I think it's got to be that baby step kind of thing. I mean, come on, Patrick. It only took us eight years to get 107. Do you think you're going to get B loss in a week? No, I, I, you know, I don't. And, and uh, you know, there were people that were saying, now this was another one, that December we were going to get the NPRM to fly over people. Did that ever materialize? Well, well I think they're probably in February now. Well, I mean, I, I would uh, totally expect the uh, people at FAA to be kind of like, hey, 
you know, we have a new uh, person over at DOT. Uh, what's going to happen with the administrator here? We got some changes and whatnot. We might want to sit tight until we figure out what the new team wants to do. That's that's kind of what I would imagine with a regime change going on right now. But that was always the case, wasn't it? Every, when when we started following this game in like 2006, every time you had an election, it was, uh, well, just hit the pause button and everyone move the chairs around and then uh, then we'll start again. So it's just your traditional six-month ad <laughs> to whatever you're doing, I think. Well, it's a, well, it's a good... Got, when they got term appointments for the administrator, it was supposed to stop some of that, but I don't really think realistically with the boss being at DOT changing that, that that's going to happen. Wow. Well, well, it'll, it'll be interesting, won't it, to see what rolls out and what can perhaps be undone if anything is done. Um, Bruce, well, down in New Zealand, what, um, what's, what's news down by you? Nothing. <laughs> it's Christmas, nothing happens here. The whole country shuts down for two months. We all go to the beach and have barbies, and that's about it, really. Yeah, I know. No, well, I can tell you um, from from my side, it's going to get hot by you. I don't know how long the weather takes to get to you. Probably a couple of weeks or a week, maybe. But in a in a week's time, it's probably going to be jolly hot down there. It's been jolly hot here. Um, but yes, we also shut down here, um, which is very very inconvenient if you want to get anything done. I saw the other video that you had, which was that uh, flight test uh, gas powered uh, machine. That was a little bit crazy. Yeah, crazy is one word for it. <laughs> but speaking of the weather, it was like five degrees overnight the night before last, and we've had wind and it's been cold. I've only just gotten to short pants, and it's already the longest day of the year. It's all downhill from here. So the summer's been a bit of a non-event so far down here. I envy your 45 degree temperatures. 48, mate, 48. And well, of course it is the longest day because you're coming to us from the future, aren't you? You're, you're on the longest day. I am. Yeah. Well, I, it was minus 10 at my house yesterday in Texas. I didn't sign up for this. I don't know where it went, <laughs> but global warming hasn't happened here for some reason, and I'm pissed. <laughs> so what's happening in the world of search and rescue, Gene? I don't know if you saw it, but uh, here recently there, there was an well, article came out yesterday that an Arizona sheriff said that his helicopters were getting too expensive to operate and they are looking to drones to patrol, which to me that was a, a little crack in the armor. It's the first one that's come out and said that the big ones are getting way too costly for them to run. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I suppose, well, the Mavic is sort of, how is your Mavic going? You, of course, having had the first real-life rescue or real-life uh, tasking with a Mavic. Public safety call. Well, we, we actually, we got our batteries. Didn't well, get the Mavic, but we got the batteries. Oh, dear. Uh, okay. Oh, so you're you're stuck in the in the great delay of the Mavic. Did everybody see, I know what I did want to say, did everybody see that amazingly Snapchat seems to be talking to the Lily people again? Or Lily's talking to Snapchat. Did everyone see that? What do we think about that? Is Lily going to live? I think it's old. It's, it's, it's stale. Same with the, that article you had about karma supposedly being fixed. I think it's over. Yeah, I think they're yeah. definitely a little bit behind the curve at this point. But um, I see them out at the Berkeley Marina at least twice a week with five or six of those vehicles up in the air and, you know, riding around on bikes and having them track and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, they they definitely have people working on them, but what they're going to do, I'm not sure yet. Well, that's astounding. I thought they were gone. I thought they were a done, done deal and, and not really happening because they were due to launch, was it last summer? Then they were due to launch in September, then October. Um, and just how long can you kick that sort of thing down the was kick the can down the road, you say, or something, isn't it, over there? How long can you keep doing that before people really do want their money back? I mean, I I personally think that uh, Helen Grainer and the that level one, they they they're the only people that have done the uh, the honourable thing. And when they oh, saw they weren't going to make their numbers, they they bailed, and that was uh, and and gave people their money back. They didn't just bail; they gave people their money back. Um, and uh, and I thought that was one of the only. I don't know. You might have um, 
uh, an opinion on this, Rob, as well as John. I thought that was about the only interesting looking machine coming out of, you know, with those angled props and anything like that. I don't know. Any yeah, sorry, on which that? one? The, the, level uh, one. The, the level one. It, had the, it was a hexacopter with the angled was... props. Oh, was that the, the one from sci fi? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I have an opinion about that. <laughs> oh, go on then. Go on then. Well, I mean, it was an interesting concept, but the problem is, what I was asking myself is, um, I mean, it's just basic physics that uh, if you can if you can affect l lateral airspeed uh, by changing by changing the prop speed on these angled propellers, uh, if you're trying to hover in a wind, does the uh, does the the wind turbulence then uh, roll back and cause you a a problem with your flight stability? Um, it, it's sort of um, you know, it works both ways with that. So I, I was questioning how well is it going to fly in any kind of real wind. What was the uh, what was the Kickstarter price on those things? That was one that I didn't buy into. I can't remember. I can't remember. I think it was. I, I think it was about a thousand dollars of a man reserves. But then back then, that was about the right price. Uh, they were all about a thousand dollars, weren't they? Plus or minus. One actually in Canada called uh, the Dream Key Plexi Drone, and it's oh, yeah. still out there. I think they're a year or two, two and a half years now, and it's you know uh, bigger than bigger than a solo. And it was supposed to carry, you know, you're supposed to strap on your your Sony point and shoot camera, you know, not even a GoPro point and shoot. And you know, it, they're two and a half years now. They're still still at it. They're still talking that they're going to make it, but I. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the, the Lily drone was a good example of like it's taken so long and then it got knocked off. So if you're going to go out on Kickstarter, I think those days are, are done. But I did yeah. want to jump back to one other story, and we may have uh, talked a little bit about this, but the, the Office of the Inspector General's audit report about the FAA and the lack of risk-based risk oversight. Uh, anybody have any comments about that? I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've maybe touched on this a couple of few times over the last, oh, I don't know, eight or nine years. But, but I thought it was kind of interesting to see it in a report that we're just kind of going on feelings with, with, the, uh, with the regulation. Well, we said it last week, didn't it? There need there needs to be real numbers made, and Bruce mentioned it. I think we all mentioned it. This just needs to be real numbers. Um, well, there is there is a real number. It's zero. Right? Nobody's been. It's, you know, no nobody's been seriously injured or killed, really. So. Well, it's a broad church, isn't it? It's a broad church. If you open it up to error modeling and you bring in helicopters and things like that, funny enough, helicopters, especially. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I've quite quite a few people have been killed by by model aircraft. Um, if I'm to be Sorry. devil's advocate, a handful. Yeah. I think it's seven. I think it's seven or eight a year. Seven or eight a year? I think. No, it is, I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. Well, I've got. I just made them up. Hang on. I, I know of one is seven. Eight. Seven. <laughs> it's a, it's a I, bit of I, I know of one in Canada, so a, a, a guy trying to land a, you know, a, back in the day, a nitro-powered, you know, 40-size airplane, took it right in the head. But that was about it. So that's Canada. Yeah, but based on the number of injuries, it's really based on more than that. But I don't think that the FAA has done a very good assessment. But then again, I don't think that the IG does a very good review of the issues. I mean, the IG's job is to find problems, whether they exist or not. <laughs> but I mean, it's the fact that they did a review of the exemption process, knowing that there's gonna be regulations developed seems like a real waste of government time and money. Well, you know, I, I do think like, you know, because somebody I was having this conversation with other people about the waivers, you know, beyond visual line of sight and at night and, and a few other, you know, flying over people or whatever. And people are kind of wondering, um, is there going to be like, say, some sort of written criteria 
to follow. And this kind of gets a little bit into, I guess, that that uh, kind of conjecture, whatever, where people in the beginning when they were doing the 333 exemptions and they didn't really know what to put in there. And then so people were putting stuff in there. And then the ones that got published and approved, then people were doing the cut and paste and all the rest of that. Or do you think we're in for another um, round of that? Well, I really think that they should just put in whatever it is that they're going to approve and let people meet that standard. It seems ridiculous to have hundreds or thousands of people applying for stuff, guessing at what the FAA's criteria is. So just put out the criteria for whatever it is. And if you want to go outside that criteria, then, you know, like if, if they did an AC um, on waivers, something similar to that. So uh, it would be a means of compliance, not a rule, not mandated, but at least you could just go with that and they could just have a form application. Yeah, like something to go on. I mean, I mean, in, in your estimation, I mean, the 333 thing got a little out of control when you had people doing the cut and paste and they were forgetting to like take the original petitioner's name out, <laughs> company name oh, and address. It was ridiculous, but it was sort of typical FAA caught in a bind, forced to do something. So they give it out to contractors. And uh, I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. But the one interesting thing that I think has come out is that the three threes were given out to entities as well as individuals. And now the 107 is only given out to individuals, which raises a whole host of issues in terms of entities that want to operate commercially. And basically the operational control is in the pilot and not in the entity. So it's, it's a very sort of interesting situation for, for corporations that want to operate drones. Have they got a, they, they must be thinking about that. that. That's a situation that can't continue. Uh, so who is that? Is it BSNF? Was that the railway people or something? They got big into it. What would they do now? They can't have hundreds of individual operators. Um, they, they must be looking into, that's a big glitch, isn't it? Well, unless they're doing it like 91 corporate pilots, but it was like a shift from the 333 to the 107 that I don't see any discussion of in terms of how that affects accountability or anything like that. I found that a lot of those larger organizations are still kind of doing the build it versus buy it decision on operations. So, you know, some, some of them are building their own internal competency on how to safely be certified and meet all the regulations and insurance requirements and things like that. And then other people are just going to third party service providers uh, that are full of qualified, experienced, certified, uh, insured operators and do their operations for them. Yeah, it's a mix between what these guys are, how these guys are solving the problem. So you're going to want to keep their... Right? Qualified. It's the individual pilots that are qualified. That's... Yep. But that big company is going to want to keep it the keep the data in, as it were. I mean, if you if you have some leaky contractors, um, as it were, you wouldn't, you you know, you'd want if you have people working in house, then uh, then they're in your disciplinary procedures, aren't they, and stuff like that. And come the day that it's required, amazing how quickly this turns into a, any regular enterprise business. <laughs> right. Well, and I think 2017 mm. is going to be the big data question year, you know, the, let's say, control uh, of data from collection to storage to uh, dissemination, you know, people looking uh, where, you know, when it goes to the magical cloud, what magical cloud is that? Where's my data? Mm -hmm. Who has access to it? Who's going to see it? Uh, things like that. I think we're going to hear a lot of that this in 2017. 
Well, it, it, it comes down to, you know, we've all come from the world where these things are really, really hard to fly. Just just getting a thing to fly, I've said it before, was really hard. Ten years ago, it was hard, very, very hard. Now it's kind of trivial, and even even you can get, even get helicopters going reliably, and <laughs> that's a good news because they can carry big payloads and do great things. So it is cool. I'm pro helicopters, really honest. Um, so it is... It is 2017 is going to be the year of data, isn't it? It's going to drive down to what are the sensors getting and, and is it actually useful and making actionable data? That's my opinion anyway. Well, while we're on the subject of risk, there's one thing that has been forgotten, I think, by the FAA and all the regulators is that intrinsically drone operations are safer than manned operations. As soon as you take a man out of the aircraft, that's one less life at risk. So they're talking about risk, risk, risk. But if we replaced more manned operations with drone-based operations, the actual overall risk level would drop significantly, wouldn't it? Yeah. You would think, and as an industry, you would think they would invest in the money or invest in the science to prove. I think it's a no-brainer. Hey, look, here we go. Look at this. Oh, check it out. We did this research, blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, you would think that uh, they'd jump all over it. That, that would be my, uh, my estimation, but not so much. Did you see the report that uh, it looked like the UK Department of Transportation was funding some research with uh, a military contractor, Kinetic? I, I don't know. And it looks like they were going to start throwing drones in the planes or throwing drones in the motors or something. I, and, and I think uh, that should be commended, but the thing is, is and I've, I've talked to uh, other manufacturers and groups about it, is I think it's important. Most groups... Uh, like when we saw that uh, garbage bag at Heathrow, you know, I, I went and I Googled uh, the plastic garbage bag manufacturers and they actually have like a policy or a statement and they have some uh, research that they've done to kind of back up their position and credibility. Yet the droners don't have anything like that. So, well, you know, you uh, go ahead. Did, did you guys in the rest of the world hear the the story about three weeks ago from Canada with the drone over Lake Ontario? Yeah, yeah. You know, it was it, nine thousand feet. <laughs> nine nine thousand feet, twenty two kilometers offshore, fifty <laughs> kilometers from the airport. Well, my uh, my thing with it is, as an industry, I think that we should be asking the questions when we go and do our uh, research first. It, at one of the problems that has always been with the integration effort with drones that I've felt is we've relied too much upon people and agencies that have no experience with commercial or civil drone ops. Uh, and most of the ops that they saw were, were military. So my, I think we need to uh, step up to the plate and do ask the questions and start the research process oursel ourselves. That's what mm -hmm. I believe. And to swing, swing back to what Bruce was saying about the uh, taking the man out of the airplane makes it safer. Well, what about the man that's having to go into the dangerous area that's being inspected underneath the oil rig and the flare stack, whatever, whatever, whatever. That's also reducing risk. It's not, a, not, not to a pilot, but to somebody that has to go and inspect something very dangerous. So, yeah, the, the, we're, well, we're just preaching to the converted here, aren't we? We all, we all know it's a good idea. Um, it's just obviously we're not doing a very good job of getting the message out there. Yeah, there, there was actually a really interesting thing I heard on, at uh, Interdrone uh, in in September from a, a tower inspector who, who pointed out an application that I never thought of. I mean, he was talking about, look, I mean, we still need people to climb the towers, but one of the risks these guys face is they start climbing, they get up there, and there's a, a hornet's nest up on the tower and they get attacked and you know now they can inspect the tower before they start climbing which is like you know yeah that's another mm. great life-saving opportunity mm. for drones yeah or killer bee country that's even worse see now you have the heat down there gary but do you guys have killer bees in africa <laughs> they are african killer bees so i guess yes <laughs> 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 yeah, we do. We do actually. They're crazy. <laughs> well, yeah, you, yeah, you don't want to get into a fist fight with them. That's for sure. There's a lot of you them. You don't even want to get trouble. near them. You know, step on them or anything. Ooh. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no, that's... Lab just set up that test facility as well, didn't they? The uh, that environmental lab where they're doing like MTDF testing and things like that. Have you guys seen that? 
Yeah, there's there, there was there's certainly a lot of that, uh, and it was very popular just uh, uh, um, before the World Cup um, in 2010, the Football World Cup. Uh, there was a lot of stuff done, and they, one of the things uh, outcomes I liked here very much was they uh, they said, you know, you'll be okay to fly things if um, it has uh, has no more energy than a kicked football in the 2010 World Cup, and that that was quite a sensible uh, that was quite a sensible analogy, and they're working it different ways. Of um, of looking at things, and I know you tried to introduce some of that over there, didn't you, Patrick? I don't think anyone listened. Um, no, but they will eventually. They're gonna. You're gonna have to because I think if you let people do research and whatever that uh, don't know what you want to do, uh, the outcome. It's not that it's like junk science or whatever, but I think they're gonna ask questions that that you may not like as much. Well, did. I know that Southwest Research Institute down here in San Antonio uh, started doing some, some testing down here. Has anybody followed up on that one? I guess I probably should do that myself since I'm so close. But uh, they were doing some drop tests from, uh, you know, 70 feet into gelatin blobs and that sort of thing to see what kind of damage they could cause. Well, definitely you should uh, follow up on that and, and let's see what they've got. Uh, that was supposedly funded by the FAA, too. They were starting out with everything from, I know the uh, the Parrot Bebop was in that group, and uh, uh, I think there were some Phantoms in there as well. So they had a wind wall set up, and they were testing all sorts of parameters for cameras and usability and the whole nine yards. So, yeah, we should probably revisit that. Hmm. And also, I wonder, you know, if they're doing different sizes and groups or, you know, it'd be nice to, to understand the, the matrix and, and see what we have going. You know, it's the same. I heard the mean time between failures is uh, one in 74 hours that some of the ashore work or whatever was foiled. But, uh, you know, they don't know what that was for quadcopters, fixed wing, how big, how small. You know, that, that's a, a wide basket in the under 55 pounds. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's there's many, many things there. Look, we've gone two minutes over the hour, so we should probably say a farewell. And at this point, I should wish everybody a Merry Christmas because that is going to happen in the time between this and the next one. Oh, look, Gene's going for the Jedi look there. Uh, very good. They're not the yes. droids you're looking for. No. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I saw that today, Gene. You didn't know that. I saw that film. It's a very good film. Saw that today. Saw that today. Yeah, no, so guys... Have a very merry uh, Christmas and I hope it's a safe one uh, wherever you're traveling and going with your families and everything. And uh, we shall reconvene again um, twixt um, the new and old year um, next Tuesday. Uh, so thanks very much and hopefully we'll see you all again next week. Cheers, merry guys. Christmas. Merry Thanks Christmas. Christmas. Bye. 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 Bye.